Hello everyone, welcome to The Biggest Ideas in the Universe. I'm your host, Sean Carroll. Today is the Q&A video associated with idea number seven, which was quantum mechanics. As you might imagine, there were a lot of questions about quantum mechanics, but in fact, I'm gonna to try to keep this particular Q&A video relatively short and sweet because many of the questions will be things I address in later videos. There were a lot of questions about the measurement process, which I intentionally uh, explained was pretty mysterious, so it's a good thing to have questions about. There's also questions that sort of leapt ahead to issues of uh, quantum field theory in particular, which we will talk about. That is one of the greatest ideas, one of the biggest ideas in the universe. Um, there is one question that kept coming up that I think is worth addressing right now because it, it really goes to the heart of an easy way to misunderstand quantum mechanics, which is the appearance of discreteness. You know, what I, what I mentioned in my explanation was there was something called the wave function, and this is sort of the fundamental thing in quantum mechanics. This is the thing psi of x that says what your physical system is. Now one question, by the way, is that sometimes I wrote psi of x and other times I wrote psi of x and t. Which one is it? Well, it's the same. It's the same thing. Psi is a function both of the coordinates of whatever you're looking at and also of time, so it's a function of x and t. But at any one time, we can just say what is the wave function now at this time, and it would be psi of x. So it's perfectly okay to write psi of x even though it is a function of both space and time. Uh, but the thing about the wave function is that it's smooth. Right? There's nothing discrete or pixelated or uh, latticized about it. It's a function. At every point there is a value. At every point in space there is a value. And some people have heard either that quantum mechanics implies a discreteness of the universe at some fundamental level, or that there is something called the Planck length, which gives some fundamental discreteness to it when gravity comes into the game. So first, there is no fundamental discreteness in quantum mechanics. Okay. Discreteness can appear because of certain special situations. This is what we encountered in, let's say, the hydrogen atom, uh, basically because we have, if you imagine, oops, if you imagine this is x and we're going to draw the wave function in a hydrogen atom, there is some nucleus here, which for a hydrogen atom is just a proton, and then there'll be some wave function, and the wave function has you know, there's a competition, right? You want to look for the lowest energy states of the electron. This is the wave function of an electron in particular. And the electron doesn't have to be in its lowest energy state, but if it's not, it will generally radiate a photon and drop down into its lowest energy state. So the first thing you want to look for is the lowest energy state of the electron. And there's a competition for the following reason. If the electron wave function becomes very skinny, then it has to change rapidly. And that rapid change of the wave function over space, the sharpness of it, costs energy, right? The electron wave function wants to be smooth and spread out. But it also wants to be near the nucleus because there's an electromagnetic force from the positively charged proton pulling the electron toward the nucleus. So there's a competition. And what you get is a wave function that looks sort of like the Gaussian, the sort of bell curve that we that we talked about. Now it's not a Gaussian, that is not the wave function of an electron, but it's that's the general shape. And then we can have more uh, complicated wave functions where it begins to look like this for a higher excitation one and begins to look like this for the next excitation and things like that. There's a series of higher and higher level energies that the electron wave function can be in. And the reason why is what we talked about in the last video, in the quantum mechanics video, that it's kind of like a string that is tied down on both ends. It's not tied down on both ends. The wave function smoothly goes to zero gradually, but it eventually does go there. And the point is the wave function can't be non-zero at infinity because it has to be normalized. Normalized is a way of saying that we know the probability of measuring the electron at some value x is given by the absolute value of the wave function for that squared. Okay, So the probability has to add up to 1, the probability of every possible outcome. So what we would say in, math in mathematic terms is that the integral of p of x dx, so the area under the probability curve for all values of x, has to equal 1. The probability of finding it somewhere where you to look has to equal 1. So that means that the integral, the area under the curve of psi squared of x, 
dx equals 1. And if the wave function just kept waving in arbitrarily large ways, it would always have more and more integral over it, under it. It would have more and more area under the wave function squared curve, so it has to die out at infinity. Now, having said that, you will soon find out that we cheat very often in quantum mechanics, and we consider wave functions that are not normalized in this way, but that's just for helpful reasons along the way, and we can always fix it up by imagining that we're cheating and the real wave function uh, dies off, but we're not paying attention to that. But when we care about the wave function in an electron, then we have to send it to zero at infinity, and there you go. Once you sent it to zero, you get a discrete set of solutions with definite energies. That's where the discreteness comes from in quantum mechanics. The discreteness is not built in. Quantum mechanics is not a theory of discrete stuff. Quantum mechanics is a theory of smooth stuff that sometimes appears discrete because of boundary conditions for the equations that we're solving and so forth. Now, that's of course quantum mechanics. When we talk about these things throughout the whole series of videos, well, we, we say that something is true, we, but we mean it within the context of a certain theory we're trying to explain, right? Like when we say that conditions at one moment in time determine the future and the past, that might be true if we're talking in the context of classical mechanics in the Laplacian paradigm, it might not be true in some other theories, okay? So when I say that wave functions are smooth, I mean that in quantum mechanics as it's understood. You can imagine trying to improve quantum mechanics, or at least extend it, to include gravity, okay? So gravity comes along with this idea of Newton's constant. Newton's constant, you saw, oops, actually I should probably capitalize Newton, right? He was a famous guy, Newton's constant of gravity. You saw it in the gravitational force equation. The force due to gravity is g times one mass times the other mass over r squared, the famous inverse square law for gravity. So that g is Newton's constant. When Planck comes along and gives us h, the constant that is associated with quantum mechanics, we now have three famous constants that we can put to some good use, right? Three constants. We have g for gravity, h bar, usually physicists these days like to use h bar, which is h over 2 pi, and of course the speed of light, c. And one of the very first things that Max Planck noticed when he invented his constant h, or now h bar, is that you can take dimensionally, you can take g, Newton's constant, h, Planck's constant, and c, the speed of light, and combine them to define apparently fundamental looking quantities like length, time, energy, mass in a certain set of units called Planck units. In particular, the only one I'm going to use right now is the Planck length, which is, let's call it L sub P for Planck, and it's defined by the square root of H bar, I wrote it down here because I can never remember, H bar over G divided by C cubed, okay? And numerically, it's approximately 1.6 times 10 to the minus 33 centimeters so that's very tiny. It's a very tiny thing, Planck's constant. That's about Planck's length. That is about 10 to the minus 20 times the radius of a proton. So if you think the protons are small, the Planck length is much, much smaller than that. Now, you may have heard people claim that on distances approaching the Planck length, space-time itself is either non-existent or discrete, comes in little dots or whatever. Well, we have no idea what happens to space-time at, like, at distances approaching the Planck length. We don't know. We don't. Sometimes we say we don't know, but kind of we do, like in the sense that uh, we don't know, we haven't proven that p does not equal np, uh, but we kind of suspect that it's true. We honestly don't know what's going on with space-time at the Planck length. The reason to expect that something goes on is the formula for the Planck length involves quantum mechanics, gravity, and relativity, okay? H bar, G, and C. So there's this feeling that once you quantize gravity and have a true theory of everything, including the emergence of space-time itself, something will happen at the Planck length. Maybe it's that space is discrete. Maybe space just doesn't 
exist as a useful concept anymore. If you're a string theorist, maybe the Planck's length is approximately the size of a string. It's not exactly because there's other factors in there, but there's some relationship there, okay? But the truth is we just don't know, okay? And in fact, it's completely possible that space-time is utterly smooth all the way down to the Planck length, or uh, sorry, all the way down to zero. That's completely on the table as one of the possibilities. So it might be true that there's some fun fundamental discreteness at the Planck scale, but we honestly don't know. And if it's true, it's because of gravity. Newton's constant appears in there. It's not intrinsic to quantum mechanics itself. Likewise with the Planck time, you can define a, a unit of time called the Planck time, uh, which is very, very short, very, very fast you might think that time is discrete on intervals of the Planck time. Maybe, maybe not. Actually, most theories of gravity, quantum gravity, don't have time being discrete to the Planck time at all. It might be true, but we honestly don't know. So don't believe everything you're told out there in popular physics land. Maybe this is true, but we have to be honest about what we don't know. Okay, that was the sort of uh, brush out of the way clear the ground question. What I really want to do is take advantage of this Q&A video to discuss something that honestly I should have discussed in the regular video, but it was getting a little long in the tooth, so uh, I cut it short. I want to go into, you know, we go from the wave function psi of x, and we get from that a probability distribution for observing the electron or whatever particle at different values of x given by psi squared. I should be careful and write it psi of x squared. And this is the Born rule, right? This is the probability rule invented by Max Born. Um, Schrodinger invented his wave function hoping that it would be something physical and measurable. It was Born who gave it this probability interpretation and said actually it's a probability you're going to make a certain measurement. And that is what we still use today. So you might think, it's very very natural to think, that the wave function is not real, it's just a tool, right? We, we've had, before we ever got to quantum mechanics, we had the notion of a probability distribution. In statistical mechanics, which was set up in the 19th century, in the 1800s, uh, people like Boltzmann and Maxwell had this idea that if you have a box of gas, like the air in this room, you don't know where every single atom or molecule is, you don't know how fast it's moving, but you can have a probability distribution that says what is the probability that a certain atom or a certain molecule will have a certain location and a certain momentum, okay? The distribution function it's sometimes called. But that is purely an expression of your ignorance. Boltzmann and Maxwell didn't think that there was no such thing as the location and velocity of all the different particles. They just admitted they didn't know them. So when you see something like the Born rule, like this probability distribution in quantum mechanics, of course your first guess is going to be that somehow quantum mechanics is about our ignorance of the real situation going on, okay? I don't think that's true. In fact, most people don't think that's true. There's some plucky holdouts who think that that is what it's about. If that's what it's about, it's way more subtle than just saying the electron has a location x, but we don't know where it is, okay? And so that's what I wanted to get into. What is the reason why we don't just treat the wave function psi as a tool for figuring out a probability distribution? Why, do we, why are we tempted, at least, to attribute some reality to it? I keep having to use these weasel words because physicists don't agree about what quantum mechanics actually says. So I have my opinions about what the right way to talk is, but I can't talk that way yet. In the next video, we'll go into a little bit about the different uh, foundational theories of quantum mechanics, and then you can draw your own judgments. But so to get here, I need to talk about the fact that quantum mechanical wave functions can interfere with each other. This is just one of the most absolutely important uh, features of quantum mechanics, interference. This is what separates wave functions from classical probability distributions, okay? And there is a nice way to talk about it, the very, very famous double slit experiment. So that's what we're gonna talk about. You know, when I wrote my uh, book, Something Deeply Hidden, I, I tried, I had an aspiration to like, not use all of the same explanations and thought experiments and illustrations and examples that everyone else uses. So the two that I really didn't want to use were Schrodinger's cat and the double slit experiment. And guess what? I used both of them because you think about it and they're both really good. They both really explain something that is very, very important. So why not? We'll talk about the double slit experiment. Also, you know, that it's nice to be novel and try to do something a different way, but 
people are not blank slates. People do not read your book with zero knowledge of the stuff you're talking about. So it is also important to make sure that people understand what you're saying in the context of what they've already heard elsewhere. So people have heard about the double slit experiment, therefore it's important to talk about. One thing to emphasize about the double slit experiment is that it was not like one of the foundational inspirational experiments that drove us to quantum mechanics. The double slit experiment was talked about and we knew what it would do long before we ever did it. I know that Feynman uh, popularized the double slit experiment in the Feynman lectures on physics. I'm not sure if he was the first to say everything we're going to say about it. There was a classical version of the double slit experiment by Thomas Young years before, but the quantum mechanical one has important wrinkles. I think it's eventually been done. These days we've done the double slit experiment, but it's very hard to do for reasons uh, that we'll explain. So here is the experiment. You have some source which shoots out electrons, let's say, okay? And out of it comes electrons and, you know, we don't know exactly the direction they're going in. It's not like a laser that is perfectly collimated. And then we have, let's see if I can uh, make this a bit more impressive. We have two slits, okay? So we have a barrier that has two slits in it, like that. And then on the other side, we have a detector that can actually, you know, flash when an electron hits it. So here are, this is the uh, barrier, I guess we called it, with two slits that the electrons can pass through. And here's the detector screen. And what would happen, so we're gonna go through different examples of what you might guess happens, okay? So in this kind of setup. Um, so how can I do that? Let me see if I can actually just do this. So what I'm gonna do is copy this, duplicate, good. And I'm gonna go through different possibilities, okay? So what if you send waves through the slits? So instead of sending particles, what if it, you just like the, submerse the whole thing in water and literally like pound it on the water so that a wave uh, passed through and waves, you know, propagate outward in wave fronts like that. And uh, that was a little sloppy. I can do better than that. Let's like not let it hit. And what happens is when the waves hit the slits, they sort of, if they hit the barrier, they just stop. If they hit the slits, they go on through the slits, but they separately propagate outward from each slit. So what you get is uh, circular waves coming out of this slit, and then another set of circular waves coming out of this slit, okay? So when you hit the detector, let's say that in this case, what the detector detects is the height of the wave hitting the detector. So there will be places like right here where you get constructive interference. I hope you can read that, constructive interference. In other words, the two waves, one coming out of one slit, one coming out of the other one, go up and they go up in the same place. So they actually add together. But then you might get another place where one wave is up, but the other wave is down. Actually, that's probably not there, let's say that that is uh, here, okay? This is at the crest of one wave, but at the trough of another wave. And there you would get destructive interference. So they would cancel out, right? Because a wave can either go up or go down and you add a positive number to a negative number and they cancel out. So what you see over here isn't what we call an interference pattern. You would see sort of a lot of tall waves right in the middle, and then they would there'd be a place where they almost canceled out, and then another peak where they generally constructively interfere, and then they would cancel out, and so forth. So you'd get this kind of pattern of waves coming together and interfering with each other. That's the wave situation. Okay. What about if we just sent out particles? I'm not gonna redraw it, let me just do particles here. If we just sent particles through, and they all already look like particles on the diagram, so that's good, then basically if the particles hit the barrier, they just stop. If they go through the slits, then they would just continue on with whatever momentum they had. And the pattern you would see of dots of particles on the detector screen would look more or less like this. 
there'd be two big peaks where the two slits had particles going through them, okay? So that's the expectation before we did anything quantum mechanical. We talked about classical particles, classical waves, classical particles, you go through the slit and you hit the other side. There's no interference or anything like that. Classical waves, you go through both slits at the same time and therefore there can be interference and that is in fact what you see. This is what Young did with light. This is one of the demonstrations that light has a wavelength character, that light goes up and down, okay? There's, there are interference patterns. So what happens when you do electrons, quantum electrons? So again, I'm not going to try to cut and paste. There's a source. There is the barrier. And then there is the detector. Once again, and you can ask the question, quantum mechanically, what should happen? This is very difficult to actually do the experiment because electrons are tiny little things. Uh, they're, even if they're wave functions, those wave functions generally have tiny little wavelengths. And so in order to notice the waveness of it, you want the whole shebang, including the distance between the slits, to be not that much bigger than the wavelength of an electron. That is a hard thing to arrange quantum mechanically and experimentally, but you can do it. People are very, very good at this. So what do you see when you turn on electrons? Um, well, of course, we know that at the detector screen, oops, that's a thick one. And here's the, here are the slits. Um, we know that if we have a good detector, one of the things quantum mechanics says is that in fact, we see individual dots at the detector, okay? So it's not exactly like the classical waves where you really had a wave going up and down at the detector. You see dots, so maybe you see a dot there. I'll make the dots a little bit bigger so that they can uh, be seen. Yeah, there's a dot. And then you see that there's, you know, you collect over time, you send electrons from the gun, they go through the slits, you get some accumulation of electrons. And what you have is, what, what you actually see If we add them all up, is something that looks like this. So something that looks like the interference pattern. We see a collection of many electrons hitting the screen, but the collection of all of them over time does not look particle-like, okay? If the electrons were particles, you would see two big concentrations of dots. But that is not what you see. You see many little concentrations with a big peak in the middle, and then fringes in, in an interference pattern, a very clear interference pattern. So that shouldn't surprise you right now, right? Because you've been trained in quantum mechanics, and you know that what passes through the slits is not a particle-like electron, but the wave function of the electron. So in the wave function behavior, it is very wave-like, not surprisingly, right? So you're going to get these interference patterns because the electron doesn't choose to go through one slit or another. The wave function of the electron goes through both slits. And this is important because this is one of the reasons, there's other reasons, but this is one of the reasons why you can't just think of quantum mechanics as a theory of probability distributions. Because if you said, well, the electron has a location, we just don't know where it is then it would still be true that when you do an experiment like this, the electron would go through one slit or the other. But this behavior of the waves going through both slits and then interfering is what is actually seen. And that is fundamentally different than what you would get if you had particles, okay? So the waviness of the electron when it's not being observed is fundamentally important. And, you know, just to make sure you understand the thought experiment setup here, the electron is being observed here, or measured if you like. The wave function of the electron does not collapse when it goes through the slits, okay? It goes through undisturbed. It does not become entangled with the slits. It does not get measured by the slits, nothing like that. Now you might, might wanna ask, well, why is that true? Very good question. Another reason why doing the experiment very carefully is hard, but you can do it. You just don't want the wave function of the electron to get entangled with the slits or anything else in between the source and the detector. So 
That should make you convinced that you can't just replace the wave function by some classical probability distribution. The wave function interferes with itself. That means that the wave function somehow has something like reality to it. Otherwise, how could it interfere with itself? Classical probability distributions don't interfere with themselves. Number one, they're never negative, so they literally can't interfere with themselves. But also, classical probability distributions are expressions of our ignorance. An expression of our ignorance cannot interfere with itself, right? But a physical wave can interfere with itself. So from experiments like this, it seems like classic that the wave function is real. Now, not everyone agrees that that's true. There are certainly versions of quantum mechanics uh, where the wave function is not real, but you need to work very hard, let's put it that way, to make something where you have a wave function, but it's not real. Okay. Now, of course, this is not the end of the story. This is, this is not quite the uh, fun part of the uh, double slit experiment. So let's do quantum electrons again, going through the slits. But now we're going to monitor which slit they go through. So you say to yourself, well, I'm still disturbed by this idea that the wave function is going through both slits. So I will set up a little spy to see which slit the electron goes through. It's not hard to imagine doing. In thought experiment land, this is trivial to do, right? The electron is an electrically charged particle. Just put little snoopers by each of the slits that will notice the electric field of the electron as it passes by. And then you know, then you know which one it passes through, okay? So what happens when you do that? Slits, detector over here. Well, we've said that when the electrons leave the source, they're a quantum wave function, but now we're spying on them. So we have, let's say, a little eyeball. Astronomers draw observers as little eyeballs. Um, that's not my best eyeball ever. I can do better. There we go. So the eyeball is looking to see, is the electron going through that slit or through that slit, okay? So it's not really an eyeball. It's some detector of electrons, but it's the same general idea. What do you get? at the detector when you notice. So you can do this. I mean, you can have a little detector that goes ping, it went through the left slit, ping, it went through the right slit. That's very easy to do, very easy to set up. And here's what you get. You get some electrons you detected, make them bigger than that, right? Okay, good. What you get, if you if you can sort of see it in my impressionistic drawing here, is not an interference pattern like that, not a wave like that, but you get two big peaks, as if particles have gone through the two detectors. So it depends on where you are and how comfortable you've become with quantum mechanics, but in some sense that shouldn't surprise you either. Remember the motto of quantum mechanics is that what the thing is, the electron or any other quantum system, is a wave, but what it looks like is a particle when you observe it. And how you changed the experiment in this case was you looked at it. You looked to see which slit it went through. So in the Copenhagen or textbook way of talking about this, what you would say is, I observed the electron, which slit it went through. I will never see it go through two slits at once. That is not something that quantum mechanics allows me to do. I will see it either as a particle going through one slit or as a particle going through the other slit. And therefore, when it eventually hits the screen, it will have behaved like a particle because I measured it and made it into a particle, okay? Now there's a different story you would tell in many worlds or other interpretations of quantum mechanics, but they all agree on what the prediction here is for, um, what you see in this experiment, and this is what has been done. So it's just driving home uh, the lesson, which you, which you should have learned already, that the wave function represents something real, or at least seems to, unless you work very hard to avoid it. And the role of measurement is absolutely crucial in quantum mechanics. 
What we will try to get to in the next lecture are ways to make measurements seem less spooky, less mysterious, less weird, um, but we don't agree, right? So physicists, I, I think I know what's going on when you measure something because I'm a fan of many worlds, but other people are fans of other ideas and they have different ideas of what a measurement really is. Uh, there are people out there who think that measurements really require a conscious human observer, okay? There's, they're a very, very tiny minority of such people, but they really do exist. I don't, you know, so just so we're clear, just so I'm not uh, hiding anything from you, even though we use the word measurement or observer or whatever, that's just a relic of how we invented this stuff in the 1920s, okay? It's not necessary. The In most versions of quantum mechanics that people take seriously today, not just many worlds, but many other ones, we have absolutely rigorous physics-based explanations for what a measurement is that have nothing to do with consciousness or agents or human perceptions or anything like that. What it has to do in most versions of quantum mechanics is decoherence, is the system that you're observing becoming entanglement with its wider environment. So we'll have to talk about that later, but uh, in the next video, in fact. But this is the experiment. This is the empirical reality that we have to match. So if you want to have a new version of quantum mechanics of your own, if you don't like many worlds or any of the other alternatives on the market, this is an experiment you have to take absolutely seriously. Okay, I only wanted to say one more thing. I know I, I said I was going to try to keep it short. So, um, and the one more thing is one of these, it's one of these questions that I have difficulty answering. I'm not exactly sure what would count as an answer. But the question that got asked several times is, what is the wave function? <laughs> or in other words, sometimes it's phrased as, what is waving? if you have a wave function? Um, you know, I think that the right answer is the wave function is the thing that the universe is. You know, the wave function, there's, there's the, the best way, it might not be the most um, satisfying way, but the best way to say it is there's something called reality, something called the universe or the cosmos or whatever you want to call it, and we have been searching since the beginning of physics for a representation of that reality in the language of mathematics or some other analogous representation. And the way that quantum mechanics represents reality is through the wave function. Okay, that's what it is. So there isn't any thing that is waving that is somehow more fundamental than the wave function. So if you have water and you have a wave on the water, then yes, you can say, look, there are water molecules and there's a collection of them and they make a fluid and it is waving, okay? If you have the electric and magnetic fields, well, then you have an electric field and you have a magnetic field and those are fields that are defined at different points in space and time and they're waving, they're going up and down. The wave function is reality. It is not, there's no deeper level. It's not made of wave function -y stuff. It's not made of uh, monads or something like that. It is the, the essence of the world. Now we can be more mathematically rigorous about it. We can say that psi is an element of what is called Hilbert space. But this is going to be singularly unhelpful if you wanna know what's waving. <laughs> Hilbert space is a vector space, okay? It's a, it's a vector space, which means that the elements of Hilbert space are vectors. You can add them together. You can scale them. It is a complex vector space. And there's some other, so complex just means that the values of the vectors, the components of the vectors are complex numbers. When you scale the vectors, you can scale them by complex numbers. So in other words, this is just for the math geeks out there. If psi one and psi two are both elements of Hilbert space, then alpha times psi one plus beta times psi two is an element of Hilbert space. So if you take two wave functions, they're vectors, you can add them together, you can scale them by complex numbers. There's a couple other of technical uh, restrictions on the kinds of vector spaces that are Hilbert spaces, complete vector spaces, they're normed vector spaces, which means you can take dot products in them, but that's what it is, it's a vector space. And you might say, well, that's a little bit confusing because 
I get that if I think of these as functions, a wave function, I get that I can add functions together. That makes sense. But why should I think of as a function as a vector? So I think of vectors, right? So, sorry, let me be clear. The word space here is not being used in the sense of the three-dimensional space we lived. We talked earlier about the fact that mathematicians use the word space to mean any set of things which has some extra structure. So Hilbert space is a vector space, meaning it is a set of things, and the extra structure it has is it's a vector space. You can add things together, you can scale them by real numbers. There is a zero vector. There's a zero element of Hilbert space. Okay, so it's a space, what does it mean to say it's a vector space? Well, this is what it means to say it's a vector space. You can add and scale, but what does this have to do with our usual notion of vectors, right? Like when we have vectors, we think of having a plane like x, y, and then there's a little line with an arrow, and then maybe there's another line. Maybe I'll make it a different color, right? Another line with another arrow, and then I can add them together by sort of shifting the yellow arrow over here. And that gets me the resultant vector like this. So if this is vector v, and this is vector w, then this is vector v plus w. So that's pictures like this you might have seen before, OK? Make it bigger. There you go, vectors arrows with lengths and directions, and you can add them together. But functions seem like something very different. This is a two-dimensional vector. A function isn't, you know, to describe a function requires not just two pieces of information, uh, but basically an infinite number of pieces of information, right? A function, if I have x, and here's my wave function psi of x, at every point there is a value. Right? If this is the single point x star, then this value here is psi at x star. And in particular, in principle, to specify the whole wave function means that at an infinite number of points x, I have to give you a complex number, psi of x. Okay. Well, as I think hopefully you're, I'm hinting, I'm uh, being suggestive enough to let you in on what's going on here. This is a two-dimensional vector space. Remember we talked about dimensionality, right? Up, down, left, right, forward, backward. I can take two things and put them together at 90 degrees, a third thing, but not more than that in space. In a plane, I can take two directions and put them perpendicularly. In other words, I can separately specify the x component and the y component of these vectors. So let me explain what that means. Let me make that a little bit more explicit. Move this down. There we go. So um, in this two-dimensional vector space, just redraw that x, y. If I have a vector, there's a vector v, I can drop down perpendicular lines to each of the axes, and this is v in the x direction, the component of v in the x direction, and this is the component of v in the y direction, and sometimes you will see v written as vx times a unit vector in the x direction, x hat, plus vy plus a unit vector in the y direction, okay? So you need to give me two numbers to express a two-dimensional vector. What I'm saying over here, for the wave function is, you need to give me an infinite number of numbers to express a function. An infinite number of complex numbers, but the difference between complex and real doesn't matter here. So it turns out that that's fine. What we have here is an infinite dimensional vector space. And you can think of expressing that vector, so you have psi of x. Forget the vector sign on x, that just makes things redundant and complicated. Um, just a one dimensional line that the electron is moving on. We expressed the two dimensional vector as a set of components times unit vectors. We can do that for this function here also. This would be uh, a sum over x of the value of psi at the point x times 
uh, a unit vector. I'm not even sure how to write this. I will, I will do what Paul Dirac did and write it like this. Okay, so this little notation means unit vector, not unit vector. It's not really unit vector, sorry. Uh, it's a basis vector at x. And what this means is, at this x star right here, I construct a delta function. A delta function was, this is all Paul Dirac who invented all this stuff, right? The uh, very famous British um, quantum mechanic. He said, look, I can think of a function as a, the collection of what the function does at x equals zero, what it does at the next point x, the next point x, the next point x, there's a literally infinite number of points x. If I tell you what the function does at every one of those values of x, I've told you the function. I want to think of that function as a set of unit vec not I keep saying unit vectors, basis vectors. They turn out not to be unit vectors because they're not normalizable in any easy way. This is why quantum mechanics is hard mathematically. This is why infinite dimensional vector spaces are hard. But the point is you have a function that serves as a basis function, which is zero everywhere except at one point where it's infinite. We call this the Dirac delta function. I realize I'm getting much more into the weeds here than I was planning on getting when I started this video, but the Dirac delta function by the, I figure by the end of the Q&A videos, it's really the hardcore audience that's listening here, right? So you, you want to hear this stuff. So I have delta of x minus x star. This is equal to zero at x not equal to x star, and it equals infinity at x equals x star. Now, because you're hardcore and serious, at least half of you are just fainting with uh, the how appalled you are that I'm saying this. If I were to plot the direct delta function, so here is x and here is delta of x minus x star, and here is the value x star, then indeed, the Dirac delta function looks like this. Zero, 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 zero. Boom, infinity. It goes all the way up. And then it's zero, 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 okay? But infinity is not a number. You can't just say the function equals infinity. If you're a serious mathematical person, you're, you're just appalled at how sloppy this is being. What you mean, I, I know how to do it right, don't worry. <laughs> how to do it right is the following. What do you mean by the function delta of x minus x star? You mean that if you take an integral from minus infinity to infinity of any function f of x times delta of x minus x star dx, well, what is that going to be? So you have some other function f, Here's f of x. This construction where you integrate f of x times delta gives you zero everywhere except at x star, and then it gives you the value of f of x. This gives you f at x star. And you might say, well, why doesn't it give you infinity? Because you multiply the infinite delta function by uh, the finite value of f, but it's also infinitesimally thin right? There's no thickness there, and you're asking for the thickness, the total area under a curve. So this is literally the, the sleight of hand that is being pulled here is that in the sloppy sense, you're taking zero times infinity and getting a finite number. You don't have to do that. I'm just doing it for educational pedagogical purposes. This expression is the definition of delta of x minus x star. It is a distribution, not a function. When you integrate it against a function, you get the value of that function at a point. Anyway, the point of all this is that Dirac delta functions can be used to make these basis vectors at different values of the, the different values of x, different values of location in space. And then rather than thinking of the function as a curve, one value for every location of x, you can think of the function as a vector. And in fact, what you would do is to be really, really, uh, precise about it, you would say, this is not the usual function that we draw. This is the vector psi, and this is Dirac's bra ket notations. This is a ket vector psi. This is an element of the Hilbert space. Okay. Now, all I'm trying to do here 
is dazzle you with math and science so that you stop asking what is waving <laughs> when we talk about the wave function. This is, remember, this is the motivational question here. What is psi? So as far as the math goes, or even as far as the physics goes, there's no problem telling you exactly what psi does. Okay. There's also no problem understanding what psi represents. It represents reality in this quantum mechanical viewpoint, which may or may not be true, but that's what it represents. We think that whatever reality is, it is represented, it acts as if it is a vector, which is an element of a Hilbert space. We don't even know if the Hilbert space of the universe really is infinite dimensional or not. That's a question for another day, but uh, it's certainly a very, very large number of dimensions. So at some point, these questions about like, what is it really? What is it made of? What is it doing the waving? These questions stop having answers. You bottom out. You're at the point where you just say, no, this is reality. This is the most fundamental level. There's no place deeper than this to go. In some sense, it's, it's uh, I mean, I'm sure there is some mystical tradition in which uh, this kind of thing is commonplace. The universe is the universe, and you're not allowed to ask further questions about it. Um, Wittgenstein says that thereof we cannot speak, we must remain silent, right? The mystical is what he said is the thing that we can't speak about. Maybe he meant the wave function of the universe, I don't know. But the point is, there isn't any simple answer in familiar everyday terms to the question, what is waving or what is the wave function made of? The wave function is an element of Hilbert space. It is a vector space of very large dimension, and that's what it is. That's the best we can say, at least right now. Maybe someday we'll be able to say even more. I think that's all I got for um, questions today. So uh, we have a good new video coming out next. I'll see you then.